We are back. It's Pro Cycling Bets with Brent and Nick. We're going to do a round talking about head-to-head betting. We'll get to that in a bit, though. Uh, we recently had all the nationals kick off the past week. So this included the individual time trials, the road races that were happening this weekend. And you probably saw on a lot of the betting markets the ability to bet on the major ones. Obviously, there's too many niche countries out there. How many are there, Nick? Maybe like 168? Um, that the betting houses obviously don't feel comfortable. Or if there's really any market there. Um, for example, Canada didn't have a... You can, you can bet on uh, Derek G to win that independent, individual time trial, which he did. Props to him. But it, there was just not enough competition. So if there's not enough competition, you won't... Or not enough information, you won't see the betting market kind of put those odds up for those nations but you had nations such as belgium or you know nick where you are in the united kingdom today they have their road race today so uh, i put that down Hopefully that pays off but we'll see and uh yeah so and are these all happening at the same time for a reason are they kind of qualifying for some international race or they just the national nationals all happen to happen around now yeah, nationals just all happen around now. Like, you know, everyone's in shape prior to the, the tour, usually. Uh, but you also kind of want to have them all at the same time. If they're all scattered throughout the year, it kind of causes havoc mm, with makes sense. Uh, scheduling things. It's like, you know, how the NHL s- schedules a little bit to um, have their, like, Olympics time, for example, at a specific um, place and point so that, you know, doesn't disrupt the season too much. So, Generally, they try and place it um, when they can. And you, you'll get most of the big names from the nation coming out. So you, you will have, but some will deem uh, to not do it uh, if they can't perform well or it doesn't mesh with their training programs. So for example, Garrett Thomas didn't do the races for Britain, uh, even though he came second in you know the Giro, like you probably know Garrett, uh, just because it, it wouldn't align well with his structure and he, he wasn't going to perform well. So... Uh, he didn't show up. So, you know, nationals is really important for most people. I think most people like to represent their nation and come first in their nation. And it allows you to wear your, your national jersey uh, at races, which is quite nice. So people try and show up, do their best. But at the end of the day, it's not uh, an Olympics. It's not uh, the world champs kind of thing, kind of level. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, kind of like that. But overall, you get to see people's form, which is kind of good. Prior to the tour, you get to learn a lot of information. Mm-hmm. And specifically, I think it provides a lot of information on time trialing capability for riders. So it's useful for, you know, us betters who want to uh, figure out if someone's going to perform well later on. You can kind of see those differences and it just gives you a, a whole bunch of information. You know, you can take a look at the course. There's, there's a dearth of information in regards to the course itself. So you won't be able to sometimes it's harder to track down how many corners there are, how many hills there are on the individual mm. time trial, just because it's like a less, you know, it's just like, it's pretty niche, essentially the nationals for some countries. So it's, it's harder to, to gain that information, but overall it's uh yeah, it's a good week. I think of uh, kind of. And typically you mentioned time trials with these nationals all be time trials and just single stage or are they like different by country or what what, what are they different Mm, like so it follows the same format as the world champs the world champs is uh two races so road racing consists of individual time trials and the stage races which is a road race so you'll have uh individual time trials of around 30 kilometers and then you'll have so that's one race and you'll have the second race that someone can win is the road race which is usually around 200 kilometers and it happens a few days after the individual time trial so those are the two disciplines per se that you'll get someone racing in um so yeah that was kicking off and then also the tour de france is just around the corner you know a week away and so the betting market is starting to open up they're starting to come out with you know just loading people it's starting to come out with different kinds of odds so still haven't dropped the big one yet the big one's always fun when they drop like 20 categories of mm-hmm. potential options which are you know usually we've talked about the head-to-heads and the top three each way well those are two options when the grand tours roll around you usually have 20 which is quite oh. fun so uh, it's a big day when they drop those odds and you get to figure out it's kind of just fun looking at them and seeing what the betting markets think 
uh, for example. Uh, right now, they only have uh, one new category, which is to place in the top three, which is a little bit different than an each way bet, which is kind of weird. Uh, you may be wondering, like, what's the difference between placing in the top three and uh, an each way bet? To place in the top three allows you to say no. So that's kind of the main difference is that they allow you to say, no, I don't believe this rider will come into the top three and you mm. can place a bet on that, which then mm, has odds itself. Um, so for example, Pagatra has probably like pretty high odds of uh, like the odds of him placing outside the top three are higher than the odds a longer at longer are longer than the odds of him placing in the top three, right? Cause he's just such a dominant rider. And mm. um, it's also worth noting that we saw uh, Pagatra are, perform remarkably probably the best performance of his career at the his nationals even though he broke his wrist uh, mm. a month ago and so he, he he actually said that the month you know how you know riders try and peak for certain races and so he said that actually and I'm, i found this a lot with my running and my marathons is that the ability to like sometimes you're forced to take some time off uh because of injury prior to a major race it actually allows you to perform that much better just because mm. your body needed that break uh, so, anyway. So Bogatra has come out really, really hot. And so his odds were uh, rather long. Uh, and now they're the same with Vingegaard last I checked. So uh, the betting markets have adjusted. Um, I debated taking him when he was still like an hour or two after the race had a bid taking him because his odds still hadn't adjusted yet but mm. um i did not because again i wouldn't even if he come i didn't want to make an each way bet because even if he comes second you know i his odds are below four right and so there's a one fourth drop off and so i still wouldn't have made that much back even if his odds are just too low still even when he was injured his odds are still too low so i i, I, I didn't place a bet but yeah um so that's kind of the recap of the past week and so for anyone who's listening you know be ready for those odds to drop it's a lot of fun kind of like a little party for for us betters but uh do you have any other questions before you kind of maybe dig in or yeah so let's go back to the nationals so which uh countries had bets available and what what did the bets look like for those yeah, for sure. So the bets were for major countries. Let's let's talk about the major countries. So when we're talking about major countries in, in cycling that have a lot of information, that have a lot of liquidity in the market, we're talking Belgium, we're talking Italy, we're talking France, we're talking Norway. Most of the European countries you'd be, be able to be bet on unless mm-hmm. there was uh, a lack of competition for some reason, if someone was completely dominant. Uh, Britain had one, but you wouldn't have seen any of the sub markets. So no North America, no USA, probably no South America, uh, no Africa, no Asia, kind of that jazz. And then you'd have the ability, just your usual bets. So top three or time trial. Sorry, top three or uh, (laughs) head to head matchups. You'd have head to head matchups for certain races. Cool, very cool. And then in terms of like the big um, drop for the tour, is this, do you know when it's going to happen or is it kind of like a surprise when it comes out? How's that work? It's, it's kind of like a surprise. The betting uh, markets don't have uh, open APIs. So I can't uh, create, a, you know, I wanted to create an app that would alert me when these odds drop, but there's no way to do that. They're pretty mm. closed off for specific reasons. I'm sure there's a way I just haven't dug into it enough. Um, you know, you can apply. I mean, now that we're a bigger, relatively bigger <laughs> company, uh, we could probably apply and they'd actually take us seriously. Uh, but you have to become a partner with them to be able to hook into their API and, and do all that. So gotcha. it's on our to-do list, but we won't quite. Uh, yeah, we haven't quite done that yet, but you, you'll notice if you have the tab open, so I have the tab, um, you know, pinned. And so when the odds do drop, it like auto refreshes some for some reason on Chrome. So sometimes I'll notice the tab. This is kind of really into the weeds, but I'll notice the tab do a little refresh. Uh, mm, yeah. And it's because it's got pushed new data. And so I'll switch over to that tab because 
because like, if I see the icon go, I know that something has changed on the site. And so usually I'll just kind of periodically check that um, throughout the day. And then it's usually helpful to be on the odds as quick as possible. Obviously, you know, we talk to our friends in the industry too, and, you know, we have these betting channels and, and whatnot. So we get alerted that way, but it's good to be quick on the odds because sometimes they're really, really drastically uh, incorrect right off the bat. Mm. And then they'll really, really correct quickly because people will take those bets that are bad that they screwed up on uh good for them uh but bad for the betting market and they'll they'll adjust the odds accordingly so if the, they get a lot of liquidity on one rider they'll be like uh oh like we we screwed up here and then they'll, they'll shorten the odds uh, for that rider. interesting i didn't realize that was a mechanic on their side is like if they see a big uptick in bets for a specific you mean specific rider then it's like okay there's probably something up with it and they might what do you think they do this kind of like reinvestigate or recalculate or those odds yeah they'll, they'll be recalculating it constantly um even uh often that the case that i will be in the moment i'll be like placing a bet and you'll see the odds will be changing kind of thing mm -hmm. and we'll say do you accept these new odds do you not this is quite common in live <laughs> betting but it's also very common if you're first on the gun when the when the odds drop you'll see that quite happen like it happened quite a lot basically um and it's like a good and bad feeling in the sense that like you know you're you know yet you found i think one of the most rewarding things about betting is like finding those incongruencies and uh, those ones that they kind of screwed up on it's like we were talking to some of our friends who who run a, who run a betting market and essentially it's it's one of those feelings where it's, it's great when you're right like he we had a, a rider who placed fourth uh and he was he was you know i think we might have mentioned this before he was like like his odds maybe were that he would play 70th. Like that's how long his odds were. Oh. He ended up placing fourth in the time trial. Mm -hmm. And but fourth doesn't matter to us, right? He needed to come top three. And it's, it's that feeling of, oh, we were so right. They were so wrong, but it doesn't really matter because like uh, we didn't get anything out of it. So you're like, you're proven right, but you don't get any payoff for being right kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing when the odds change on you when you're about to bet, it's like, oh, we were right. But yeah, like you weren't quite quick enough to kind of capture those odds. So it's a, I think a kind of fun, common feeling just to kind of talk about. Totally. And for these kind of like odds, right as they drop, you mentioned sometimes they're, they're not super accurate. So they could be a good opportunity to get, to get in on them before they're updated. What am I looking for? If I'm taking a look, I see odds drop. I'm kind of one of the first, first people in to access them. What, What's a what's a flag for me to know when's a good opportunity? Yeah, it's a really that's a good question, and I think I I, I operate a lot on autopilot right now, and I don't like uh, we you know as a company kind of just like know intuitively what what's long, and so let's try and classify that a little bit more here, and I think that's why it's a great question. Is that what you're looking for? Is you're essentially trying to feel out if a rider has a possibility of placing in the top three, right? Um, and so you have to kind of come into this knowing ahead of time what riders have that potential and then be able to do that quick research just to recalc like recalculate. Um, so you have to have some context going in just because you have to kind of quick on the draw and you have to like know in the back of your head, hey, this guy, didn't this guy do a really good time trial like last week or like, you know, last year or whatever. And then you can like kind of dig in it a little bit more. Sometimes uh, we come into the day knowing certain riders that we want to pick uh, previously and that we know might be long. Like we do, you, you can do that. You can kind of like, especially with like breakaway riders or like dark horses, like you can do the research. Like we've released a YouTube video on like dark horses or underdogs for the Tour de France. And so like you can do that research prior to the odds dropping. It's just mm. more work. Um, and so what we tend to rely on is just like our base knowledge of watching races and paying attention and keeping our ears to the ground. And then we, we hop on the ones that we know are kind of con like misconstrued. Um, it's helpful to have, it's helpful just to know the, 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 the cyclists um, and know who have been performing well or just like, you know, it's kind of like, 
I wish I had a better example, but you hear these writers podcast or you hear that, you know, oh, here's a good example. So Tarling, uh, Joshua Tarling, he's like a Brit. He's a youngster. He won the individual time trial at uh, the Nationals that just happened a few days ago. On a podcast with Garen Thomas, they they basically talk about how the whole like multitudes of the riders were like working towards to getting Tarling the white shorts, which is essentially winning nationals kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you would know that if you listen to the podcast. But again, we've talked about this before. The betting markets don't know that. Mm -hmm. And so the odds were not super long on Tarling, but like long enough that you, you had a good payday. And, you know, you came into that knowing that because you listened to the podcast. And so you, you saw those odds and you were like, these are wrong. And so also another helpful thing is like for the nationals, for example, the road race today for Britain, the uh, odds were short. This didn't help us because it's not really helpful when the odds are sh- like too short on a rider. But there was a rider from Yambo Visma who was pretty short. I can't remember the, the exact name. But it was like we talked with some friends. I mean, you know, it was obvious that they weren't going to let him win. And so the majority of the riders from Britain are pretty Ineos team heavy. So Ineos is a mm. team and they have a lot of British riders. And so Ineos wasn't going to really let, even though the Nationals aren't team based, the Ineos riders weren't going to let this Yambo Visma rider kind of take the win uh, or be allowed to go for the win. And yeah, so his yeah. odds were too short. But odds being too short are, again, not super useful. It's just like a useful kind of yardstick to know. Well, it's a little bit useful in the sense that you can know that the rider's not going to place top three, probably. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you can use that as like a a negative factor when you make your bet. But still, it's better when you have a rider who's too long and then you can take advantage of that. So. Mm -hmm. So That's really interesting. So even though there's not really a team element in the Nationals, there's still some like team allegiance and therefore you kind of see that play out in in the race results. Yeah. It was interesting hearing them talk about it in the sense that it's a little bit, they themselves as riders find it a little bit strange because they all want to win sort of, but at the same time they're going to help each other to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And so it's, but they're not going to help each other like, win the race like they usually do in a normal road race for example so it's a it's a completely different dynamic and it's really nuanced it's the one race of the year where because even with world championships which are the same format you will still typically have uh just because of the prestige and how hard that race is to win you will typically have specific leaders like a two-horse strategy uh, that will be uh even though it's not Again, it's not team based. Like nationals isn't team based, and world champs isn't team based. But you'll still have kind of teams um, and working towards a leader for that uh, specific race. Yeah, well, fair enough. Uh, one other question I wanted to ask you in terms of this kind of big drop you're watching for, for the Tour de France is there going to be head to heads dropped right away, or that's more going to be coming up like right before the stage, or when you expect to see? those bets available yeah head-to-heads happen uh, specifically uh, like overall kind of thing in the general classification who's going to perform better uh, than another rider you won't see as many overall uh, for until like you'll see a lot more head-to-heads happen when the action kicks off because the algorithms mm-hmm. can factor in the performance of the riders uh now that the race has started and so they can kind of get people who are closer together in caliber now that they didn't have that information gotcha. prior to that they don't have as much information so you'll probably only see about 10 of the big names have head-to-heads uh, compared to other certain riders of their kind of caliber at the time so and there won't be very hmm, the odds won't be very sexy in the sense of like they'll be pretty boring uh, mm-hmm. they'll be low nothing too long nothing too short and so generally we don't bet the heads to heads right off the bat. It's also overall like the thing about betting on grand tours that people should remember and take into account is, is you're locking your money up for a long time. 
right? So mm -hmm. could I be using this this money in the stages day in and day out better than I could on the overall? Um, you'll get a lot of, you know, your average Joe punters who are just going to bet on the overall because, you know, it's easy to kind of think about or you have your favorite rider and you place money on your favorite rider. Like a lot of people aren't really digging in, you know, a lot of people probably aren't listening to this kind of video podcast that we're doing to be honest uh they're just like your average person who like goes to the shop down the street and says hey i want to you know put money on xyz because like i like mm -hmm. them for example they want to be more involved in that race and so i feel like the betting market's cap eh, you know kind of cater to two audiences one the you're you're kind of like mm, yeah you joe blow and then kind of more kind of strategic punters who kind of want to get a little bit more into the weeds yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So we're talking about not off the start, head to head bets, probably not too appealing as the race progresses and there's more information about who's performing well and who's not. Again, what are we looking for, for kind of like juicy opportunities to, to put money in? Yeah. And so I think what you're looking for with juicy opportunities is you, you're kind of concerned with I think an interesting one is when I think our friends in the industry, we believe also that like when you're placing money on head to head bets, it's always better to pick that GC candidate, right? So it's always better to pick the person. So you're looking for it. Those don't happen that often, but for some reason, sometimes the betting markets will pit two riders against each other. One who's kind of like out of the GC race and another who's, who's, who's in the GC race. If you find one of those, those are like gimmies, right? Those are those are like the 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 person who is gonna work the hardest is the person who has the most skin in the game, and that's gonna be the GC contender who's like still wants to retain their position compared to the other individual. So obviously, take those. Those are kind of like ones that. Um, what we're also looking for is ones that are super long. So anything above three dot five will usually place a bet if like i would say 50 50 most of the time we'll place like a decent chunk of change on a 3.5 or higher um head-to-head -head option and that's just one we're not parlaying it we're just like strictly going in on one head-to-head -head option just because 3.5 if you think about it nhl games nfl games NBA games, all the MLB games don't usually have odds longer than 2.75 at most when you see that. And so mm -hmm. if you have enough information and, and the thing with is with bike races is so much can happen. There's so many variables in play. And if there's even a chance that that rider is going to beat the other rider, like we, we usually go for it because 3.5 is, is a pretty decent chunk of change if you put down five bucks, right? That's I don't know. Uh, we don't do math, but no, we do a lot of math. But that's like that's like twenty two dollars or something in payback, right? So that's like a pretty decent, pretty pretty good return there. Um, sometimes sometimes it doesn't make sense. Uh, so again, we're fifty fifty. Sometimes those long odds are like correct, like that rider mm -hmm. will never beat the other rider. But sometimes it's we've noticed that about fifty percent of the time those really long odds are wrong. So that's something to look out for, and then. What you also want to do is you want to not usually whenever you bet on a head to head for a sprint first, like they'll pit two sprinters against each other. Mm -hmm. That's really risky. Again, like it's, it's a toss up. Sprints are so uh, just like, you know, anyone can win this. Your chain can drop. This is again, we, we can't harp on it enough. Like betting on sprints is like just like not a great idea. There's too many things that can go wrong. And especially we never, almost never include sprinters in our parlays because mm. you're introducing just too much risk into that parlay. Like parlays are inherently kind of risky and, and you know, some call them dumb, which is fair. Like you just like to have four or five options go right in your favor. In most other sports, I, I know, again, like I've argued before that in this sport it's different, but in, in most other sports, it just increases way too much risk into the equation. And if you won't, which is true. And then if you're also putting sprinters on top of that into that equation in that parlay, it's just like way, like you're throwing away your money 
at that point yeah, yeah. to some degree. And so you, what you really want to focus on when you parlay these these bets is is you know GC riders who uh, will probably beat the other rider, right? Or some other rider who they just got wrong, right? And so you kind mm-hmm. of put mash those together. And again, there's there's a, it's it's well not again we we haven't talked about this, but it's well known that you'll probably only win fifty five percent of your bets. And okay. so this is like a well known kind of industry sports betting standard. And so what you kind of want to do is you want to place a lot of small bets that will probably like. So what we we have two kind of strategies for doing head to head bets, and you know one of them is kind of stacking the head to head. So what what that means is you start with a small head to head bet that you're really sure is going to pay off. Uh, maybe just yeah. two riders you'll parlay and then you add in risk adjust like you'll add in more risk to the equation on the next bet. So you'll add in a third rider. Mm. So that that third rider is like slightly more risky, like they might not win than the first two that you place down. Gotcha. And then you'll place another bet that includes four parla- like four head to heads, and that fourth rider will be the riskiest mm-hmm. of the three. Mm-hmm. And so you're you're ever increasing your risk. You're also increasing your 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 obviously your odds and you know the payout, but you're also you know increasing the risk with that. But you, you're so you start with your guaranteed like pair, and then you do it a triple. Like you do, but every every so often you're kind of increasing the risk, but you're also like putting the most risky on. You don't put the most risky onto the first bet because then you're kind of screwing yourself mm. right off mm-hmm. the start. Um, and so uh, another thing to keep in mind when doing head-to-head bets is it's isolating. So if you know you have what if you're, if you're doing a lot of these small bets, you don't want to keep one rider consistent across all those bets because what if they get into a crash Mm. and you lose the chance of any of those bets paying off so you want to kind of do a combination of these these kind of stacking but also isolating certain bets and it's like a little tricky but you can you can do it and if you i mean there's a lot of math involved and this, this is a lot of like we don't always do it don't get us wrong like if we're doing this every day like we probably it'd be a bit too much but you can do like basically you're doing statistics and some combinations kind of and making sure that you don't have um one rider who will completely screw up all the bets um and if you do have one rider across all the bets make sure it's a rider who's for sure gonna perform uh you can't you can you can never like you can never bet that a crash won't happen uh, and if it happens, that's too bad. But try and try and pick the rider who will least likely crash, uh, and also you know kind of win as well. So that's what those are some of the things, some strategies people can think about when they start to do head to head bets. Cool, that's super cool. You mentioned something I didn't realize before, but with parlaying, you can like have the same head to head bet multiple times in different like like bundled with different other bets as a parlay. I didn't realize I was in my mind, I was thinking you're only betting once on a specific head to head, but I guess you mix and match and have a bunch of different kind of groups of bets. Yeah, you can mix and match. And and, sometimes you can't though, uh, depending on what the industry or the betting house kind of locks in. So it's, 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 it's worth remembering it's, this is kind of complicated and we're going to, we're going to say this wrong, but you, you sometimes it won't let you do head to head bets if you also have the rider in the top three to win, oh, uh, wow. there's some like, yeah, there's some like isolation issues they have with y- you having too many mm, things tied together. It's like, we've talked to the, the people who run the betting house and it's like kind of complicated and we'll, we'll, we'll maybe have a chat about this in the next podcast, but essentially, y- yeah, you can't have too many things tied together. So if you've bet Pogacar to win the top three, you might not be able to use them in the head-to-head bets just because of how the system works. So they might lock you out of that. So gotcha. if anybody's wondering why you can't bet someone in the head-to-head, it's because you can't have too many things tied to one rider. Um, and like at this payoff situation, it's just kind of complicated. 
Uh, but yeah, sure. so, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to jump in there, but you might have had a follow up question. Yeah, this might be kind of off the wall, but what's in terms of like parlaying, is there some restriction on, let's say I make a specific bet and I want to parlay another bet. Does it have to be like within the same stage or like within this, like the same style of bet, like I normally parlay head to head and another head to head, or like I can kind of parlay like whatever's available. You know what I mean? What's the restriction there? Yeah, it depends on the betting app you're using. Uh, the some betting apps just let people go wild and then parlay basically anything. With the ones we use, you can only do head to heads, um, and you can't like tie a head to head in a cycling race to a MLB. Gotcha. Blue Jays winning. Yeah, you, yeah. you can if you go uh, I'm to a casino or you know a betting house and do that. But like through the apps, they really only let you do one sport, kind of one kind of option like that. Um, you can also like we we typically parlay some MLB games a lot of the time too, and but it's all MLB games tied together. So that's how it kind of goes. But that, that's just to say that's just how the app works. You can definitely. If people really want to spend their money that way, then yeah, for sure they can they can go ahead and, and find ways to parlay things together that are really not <laughs> correlated. No, that makes sense. As a little more more follow up here, you mentioned fifty five percent of your bets being right. That's kind of the goal, and you mentioned placing a bunch of small bets. So, if, let's say for like one specific stage of the tour. How many bets are we talking? Like you place in like five, 10, 15, or what, what are you doing? Or what would you recommend to a typical um, better? Yeah, well, we'd recommend five to 10. I mean, I would start, I would just do five for the average better. I think once you get, you know, sometimes we do 10 if we're like have a lot of time that day or we really don't want to do our real jobs, but it, we'd, we'd recommend just doing five because then it, it's, it's really kind of like, complicated unless you want to like spend time with the spreadsheets uh, but we we definitely would push people to do more than just one bet um cool. we if what we kind of look for what you look for right is like you can kind of figure out your average payout so what we aim for is usually for our parlays we aim for around creating 18 for the odds potentially is a good payout like sometimes mm-hmm. we go crazy and, and we go for like 50 just because we know like like that's like a 50 to 1 right or like 1 to 18 is like and, and so what we're trying to create is like a 1 to 18 1 to 10 is a very probably rational bet and we're probably a little bit aggressive in what like aiming for 18 so if people just want to create a five bets that will do 1 to 10 payoff um you'll still you're hedging essentially you'll still make let's say you make five bets each of those bets uh you put a dollar down on the head to head and so you have a ten dollar payout right you'll still win the chance of you winning one of those five bets if they're all isolated uh is decent uh, mm-hmm. we would say and so you still have a payout of five dollars even if you or like six dollars even if you won one of those five bets um compared to um yeah we think the chance of you winning one of those five bets uh, at least in our case, in our scenario, and like what we've seen in the past is quite high. And so, uh, you know, uh, what we would recommend is just like do basic math on about how much you're putting down and what is your average payout for all those bets. And then you can kind of figure out how much money you'll probably make. Because usually if you do a little bit of research, like we're a big promoter that you can win one of those five bets. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Cool. And I think we're we're just about at time here, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. We're gonna keep things a little bit tight, so to keep people engaged. If, if anybody is engaged, but you know, we're happy. We thanks to everyone who's listening, who's listened this far. If you guys have any questions, comments, anything like that, feel free to drop them below. We're happy to read through them. Obviously, we'll keep posting. Um, we'll do a bunch of posting over the tour de France about some new betting strategies. And, and we'll talk about those when the odds drop as well. Uh, we're going to, we've been really heads down on focusing on creating this kind of book um, with regards to cycling. So, you know, wait, you know, be excited for that to drop as well. Uh, but overall, we hope everyone, you know, has fun with the bets and is excited for the tour de France. And thanks to Nick for coming on as always. Thank you, Brent. Da, 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 da.